Lab this week we'll meet downstairs in that same room we met at before. Downstairs. We'll meet there and have some pre-lab discussion before we go upstairs. Okay, other questions about lab or any material before we get started? Physical properties. Physical properties. Okay, guys, good morning to you all. Let's get going. Hydrogen <coughs> bonding. <coughs> Particularly strong dipole, dipole interaction between a hydrogen bonding acceptor, which is an O inter F lone pair, and the lone pair forms a non covalent interaction with a hydrogen that is on an O inner F. This hydrogen is particularly electron poor uh, because it's bonded to the O inner F. And of course, these guys have electrons, which are particularly electron rich, and so we can have coordination. Here we show a sort of a hydrogen bonding network of molecules of 1, 2, 3, 4 alcohol. It's butanol. By the way, nomenclature video only. I sent you that by email. Um, and so all these molecules of butanol can be holding hands by hydrogen bonding. They all have an H, uh, potential acceptor, I mean, I mean donor. And then they, of course, also have an O. And so you can show an acceptor and a donor coordinating together by a uh, non-covalent interaction or so-called intermolecular force or intermolecular attraction. And uh, you got a gazillion of these hydrogen bondings going on in your flask. I'm just showing two or three. You can continue on and just... So this is a hydrogen bonding network. The non-covalent interaction is shown with sort of a dash. Um, and so these molecules are holding hands pretty tightly. This is more than just a pinky bond or pinky IMF, which would be easily overcome when you go to boil the compound. You're going to have to put much more heat into this compound to break these IMFs because hydrogen bonding is a particular strong IMF. We thus would predict a relatively higher boiling point. I have some questions over here. Again, I'm assuming you can see this. It's, I don't know why it's a little bit difficult. They changed the bulb. I don't know if that affected anything, but uh, please yell. Questions on the right. Uh, this compound here, I think we showed above, it cannot hydrogen bond to itself, right? I mean, you, do you have an acceptor, hydrogen bond acceptor in that compound? No, you, you also do not have a donor. So it cannot hydrogen bond to itself. Um, all right. Now it does have dipole-dipole interaction because you do have a, a permanent dipole here, partial plus, partial minus. And the partial minus of one molecule can interact with the partial plus of another, dipole-dipole interaction, but that's not the strong hydrogen bonding. Question, can this ether compound hydrogen bond to itself? I see a hydrogen bond acceptor. Do you see a donor? The other molecule of itself would not have a donor. It's like both molecules have the fuzzy part of the Velcro and they don't want to stick together. You need a molecule that has the other part as well. No, it cannot. But question, can a hydrogen bond to water? Yes. Yes. Uh, you got water around, and we can have an interaction. This would be the H bond uh, donor, and this would be the hydrogen bond acceptor. So yes, it can hydrogen bond to water, but it cannot to itself. How many H bond acceptors and donors are in the antidepressant effect source shown here? How many acceptors? Uh, that question's a little bit ambiguous. You said three. I assume because we have two oxygens and a nitrogen. But this oxygen has two lone pairs. Can each lone pair act as a acceptor? 
It can. It may actually vary. Um, you got to be careful about. You, I would. I would probably want you to clarify the question. Say, excuse me, are you considering only the number of atoms here that can act as acceptors, or are we looking at the lone pairs? Um, I'd probably say lone pairs. One, two, three, four, five. Um, how, how many donors in this compound? <coughs> yes, one. And H is on an O, N, or F right there. By the way, since you always draw in the H that's on an O, N, or F, the H is going to be drawn in. H is on carbon. Are they hydrogen bond donors? No. Uh, it's, only got, it's clearly only got one donor. Um, can this drug hydrogen bond to itself if you had another molecule? By the way, when we say itself, are we talking about intermolecular or intramolecular? Another molecule would be intermolecular. Can it hydrogen bond intermolecularly to another molecule itself? Sure, this H could coordinate with the nitrogen of another molecule, right? This being the nitrogen, and then just cut it off. You could show lots of intermolecular. Or this H could, could coordinate to the oxygen of another molecule. Can this molecule? Uh, do any in, intramolecular hydrogen bonding. Intramolecular, that means internal within one molecule. Yes. Could you show such a interaction? Well, if we drew this bond sort of out instead of condensed like this, and there's a lone pair sitting here, can you see that right there? A lone pair can interact with that H, and that's a hydrogen bonding <coughs> IMF, right? It's actually a nice one, two, three, four, five, six membered ring, which we'll learn is a good ring. So you got, boom, the H and the nitrogen sitting there in hydrogen bonding. <coughs> that would be what? In, uh, intramolecular. H bond, right? So, understanding those terms and the things associated with potential hydrogen bonding. A couple of compounds, well, sets of compounds. Comparing to these two, this one has a much higher boiling point. Why? Hydrogen bond. Two molecules of this, mole of this compound can stick together by hydrogen bonding. It's a pretty strong intermolecular association, intermolecular force, IML. Like if each of you guys is, a, is one of these compounds, you're holding hands with your neighbor pretty strong by a hydrogen bond. Your O is coordinating with her H. Okay, hydrogen bonding. Can this guy hydrogen bond to its neighbor by? No. You've got a you've got a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor. You have a hydrogen bond acceptor. That's too bad. You, two acceptors don't form an IMF. Lower intermolecular forces, lower boiling point, right? These are constitutional isomers, same formula, different connectivity. We predict a much higher boiling point for this one. Down here are some nitrogen compounds. Again, constitutional isomers, same formula. This one has a higher boiling point. Why? We can envision intermolecular hydrogen bonding. One molecule of nitrogen, the other molecule the H. Those are your two components. Stick together like super glue. 
a strong IMF. This one cannot hydrogen bond to its neighbor. It's only going to have, you're going to have two acceptors sitting next door to each other. No good. Back to boiling point. Can you explain the trend? Water, boiling point of 100 degrees. Lots of hydrogen bonding between two different molecules. H2S, lower boiling point. No hydrogen bonding possible. Yes, it can do dipole-dipole, because you do have polar bonds. It is a polar molecule. Partial positive one end associating a partial negative another end. But that's weaker, because this dipole-dipole is very strong. We call it hydrogen bonding when it involves an O and an F. Weaker dipole-dipole, lower boiling point. This doesn't even have dipole-dipole. There's no polarity here at all. The only way these molecules uh, associate <coughs> with each other is by what type of IMF? Dispersion. Dispersion. Dispersion forces, London forces, Van der Waals forces. It all means the same to me, maybe not to you. And that's very weak forces. That's actually induced forces, these weak induced forces. It's like pinky bond. Very easy to overcome. Boop. A little bit of heat. I'm boiling. Mm -hmm. Negative 162 is enough heat to, to boil it. Um, OH got cut off over here. Two hydroxy groups on, it's really two carbons. Similar size as this, just hydrocarbon. 200 degree difference in boiling point. Why? Lots of hydrogen bonding. By the way, if you take this molecule with just one OH, the boiling point is about 100 degrees Celsius. Now we have two with just double the potential for hydrogen bonding between molecules. Butane is a gas at room temperature. Less IMF. Hydrogen bonding holds DNA together. The DNA double helix held together by what? Hydrogen bonding between bases. And it turns out this certain bases really like to pair up with each other because of hydrogen bonding. Uh, AT base pairs. Um, this is just the nucleoside portion. But it's two different molecules. It's not the same molecule, two different molecules. Uh, they're not showing the lone pair here. But the lone pair of this nitrogen is hydrogen bonding to the H of this compound. And then the oxygen lone pair is hydrogen bonding to the H of the other compound. But these compounds are built so you get these two interactions here as they approach each other. This guy over here, CG based pairing, actually has three hydrogen bonds as it approaches. And those three hydrogen bonds is like three pieces of Velcro holding everything together. Uh, so these molecules are, have the right architecture to really come together. And that DNA can be flopping around all kinds of ways, but these hydrogen bonding, boop, holds it right there. These IMFs, non covalent interactions, and so you get this particular arrangement, a double helix. Um, We'll talk more about rotations uh, down the road. Potential rotations, confirmations. Uh, the fourth type of IMF, and uh, thus the strongest, is your ionic attractions. Now, 
Now, in your hydrogen bonding or your dipole-dipole, the charge is created by uh, electronegativity. Induction. Induction, by the way, is where is the effect of electronegativity. The electron is being pulled, okay, through a single bond. I think that's on the green, on the green outline, right? Induction. That's an important term. Inductive effects, okay? Inductive effects lead to polarity. With ionics, we don't need induction. You just, you just have charges, formal charges. Um, and these formal charges are really going to have a lot of attraction, okay? Uh, the highest amount of attraction. Something like sodium chloride, which is ionic, boiling point is 1,400 degrees. Okay, if we go to an organic compound, if you look at this neutral alcohol, ethanol, boiling point is 78. But we can make this ion on the end, we can make the oxygen negative, and then have some type of positive as a counter ion, or the cation. And so it would be analogous compound, but in the ionic form, Boiling point is now greater than 500. Because with these ions there, the molecules are super strongly associated. Now it's a collection of ions. Now obviously the, this is coordinated to that, but then you can consider lots of hand holding. You know, the negative of another one can also be associated with the sodium. And then the sodium can be associated with this one. But all these ions are very strongly associated. In Gen Chem, you probably talked about a unit cell, things like that. Um, strong associating between these formal ions. Um, and so that's why most of the time, anything ionic is going to be a, a solid because they have so much IMFs between the molecules or between the ions that it leads to it being a solid. Um, because liquids, for it to be a liquid and the slippery and the molecules are sort of moving, that's what liquid is, you can't have like super strong IMFs. The stronger the IMF, the more it's going to fix everything. And then you're solid. Ionics tend to be solid, although there is a class of ionics called ionic liquids. That may be my first chance to say there's an exception to everything, right? Yes. Okay, let's look at uh, melting point for solids. Same idea, the more IMS you have, higher the melting point. Same idea as boiling point. Look at these two compounds. One has melting point of 126, one's 44. Which one has the highest, higher melting point? The question is really what? Which one has the most IMFs? That's really the question, right? We can reframe the question. Somebody said the first one, what? You can envision two molecules, hydrogen bonding to each other? Maybe the, these are H's, we can draw them out instead of condensed. We can have another molecule where maybe the oxygen is hydrogen bonding to, this is just a, another molecule cut off. The H of this molecule hydrogen bonding to the O of another one. You could, sh you could show other hydrogen bonding interactions as well. Can you show this molecule hydrogen bonding to another one of itself? No. The other one, I mean, this one you could say has an acceptor. The other one would not have a donor. The other one's the same thing. Is there a donor in here? By the way, here we go. We finally get this answered. What's an ME? Methyl group. Nomenclature. What's a methyl group? Well, what's methane? CH4? A CH3 connected to something. Methane, methyl. YL is when it's a substituent. Nomenclature. 
By the way, I have more than one person ask what an ME was. There's no ME up there. It's abbreviation. I use it a good bit. Um, I did a Google search. I, su I searched ME organic chemistry on my desktop. And in 0.03 seconds, it said that it came up and it told me all what a methyl group was. All right? So if you see something and you don't understand it, I might log on. It was beautiful. Describe methyl groups and all types of applications and why methyl groups are particularly seen in drugs a good bit. Okay, that's just an abbreviation for melting. Yes, this one has a higher melting point. Make sense? More IMFs, higher melting point? Same trend as boiling point? Okay, solubility. Uh, you may have heard of the old adage, like dissolves like. That means a compound would dissolve best in a solvent with similar IMFs. You guys, you guys know what dissolve means? So we'll be trying to dissolve things this week in lab. You need to know what dissolve means. I know you guys know what it means, but sometimes you act like you don't. You ever dissolve sugar and water in your kitchen? When is it dissolved? When all the sugar is gone, it's now dissolved. It ain't really gone, right? It's dissolved. All right? Do you dissolve the sugar in cold water, tap water, or your hot water? Hot water, hot water right? Usually heat helps <coughs> dissolve things. 95% of the time, heat helps. There's a few interesting cases where heat actually does not help. It actually hurts. But usually, just about all the time, heat helps. <coughs> uh, but which is the best solvent? <coughs> you can heat any solvent. Uh, this week in lab, we're going to start getting the idea about solvents. But we're also going to be doing some acid-base chemistry. Because you can also dissolve things using acid-base chemistry. Uh, question, which amide? Those are amides, right? That's the main functional group there. Which amide above is most soluble in water? Which would you predict? <laughs> Which one has most similar IMFs to water? Well, what do we know about water? Very polar. Hydrogen bonding is considered polar. That's a polar phenomenon. Okay? But you have to have dipoles. Okay? So we call that polar. Lots of hydrogen bonding in water potential. That's the main IMF. It don't have any ionic IMFs, because it ain't ionic. Lots of hydrogen bonding. We want, we want a compound that has similar IMFs. I would say, well, which compound has potential for lots of hydrogen bonding? First one. First one. We already really answered that when we looked at uh, melting point. That is, this compound can hydrogen bond to water more. Can the other compound hydrogen bond to water? Yeah. Yes, it can. I mean, the O lone pair can hydrogen bond to an H of water. But guess what? This compound can do it more. If you look at every potential hydrogen bonding association, you're going to find more between that compound and water than that one. For example, because that one has an H bond donor, and the oxygen here can act as an acceptor. Where you can't do that with the other compound. So I call this, this is a very polar solid. I call that compound more polar because I see more hydrogen bonding potential. Which compound would be more soluble in hexane? Well, this is just a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon straight chain <coughs> alkane. Assess the polarity of this. Nonpolar. The only thing it has is Van der Waals attraction. Temporary. Very nonpolar. It's going to be best at dissolving nonpolar compounds. 
Well, which compound is least polar? One on the right. One on the right. The one that has less hydrogen bonding. Now, keep in mind, we'll do this numerous times throughout the course. We're, we're doing relative here. I'm saying which is more, most soluble, or more likely to be soluble. That one's more likely to be soluble in hexane. Is it soluble in hexane? I don't know. It could be that neither one are. But guess what? Of the two, that one's more likely to be. It's a relative, comparative, not an absolute statement. Okay, we'll talk more about that as we go along. The lab addresses some of that. Light dissolves light. Uh, here's some solvents here. You need to start getting familiar with solvents. First off, you have water as a, as a solvent and you have organic solvents. In gen chem, you say water is a universal solvent, right? Well, that's... CRAP. Water is a lousy solvent. It's a universal solvent for salts, like sodium chloride, because this is very polar. It's ions. And that's, a fair, that's the most polar solvent you can have. So it's the best solvent for polar stuff. But it's a lousy solvent for organics, because most organics have some hydrocarbon portion. These are just structures, but and so organics are not completely just ions. Uh, organic solvents here. Some. I've divided these into two, polar versus nonpolar. Polar solvents over here like acetone, you use to wash your glassware in lab. Okay? Ketone, three carbon ketone. Acetic acid, you can make the 5% solution in water and call it vinegar. Okay? You don't want to put pure acetic acid on your salad, you'll end up with turns on your tongue and your eyes swelling up. <clears throat> okay? We'll see these as we go along. You might pull these out next time you hear a solvent. Nonpolar. Got to be careful though. If I were to give you this molecule here and ask you if it was polar or not, what would you say? By the way, we need, we need to go back and do those two lone pairs, right? Polar or nonpolar? Forget this. Uh, we got two dipoles between hydrogen and carbon. Are these going to cancel? No, we know that's a tetrahedral arrangement. You're going to have a, a net molecular dipole. Okay. Just like with water. Except these are just carbons. Okay? That's strictly a polar molecule. So why the heck am I calling it nonpolar? This is why. And this is commonly done, not just by me. Polar solvents are ones that are miscible with water. They mix completely with water over here. Nonpolar solvents, I'm calling them nonpolar because they don't mix with water. Even though diethyl ether is a polar molecule, it's not polar enough to mix with water because it has also some hydrocarbon. And the hydrocarbon is hydrophobic. The hydrocarbon portion is very nonpolar. And so it hates water. And so even though you have a molecular dipole, it's apparently not strong enough to make it soluble in water. Now the lacetate, it's a polar molecule. Because it has a polar carbonyl and there's no symmetry and the, the dipoles are not going to cancel. It's a net polar molecule. But it ain't soluble in water. Guess what? If I remove one carbon 
and just make this one carbon coming off the oxygen instead of two, this is actually soluble in water. Because we got rid of one of those hydrophobic hydrocarbons. How would you guess that? You never would. We know that from lab, though. But at the last I it's not. That's why I'm calling it nonpolar. These are thus good for extractions. I think it says there, and we'll talk about that when you need two layers, a water layer and then this. You can't do extractions with these because you will only have one layer if you have water around. They mix with water. That's why when you make an uh, absolute and uh, water and two lemons, you only have one layer. All right? Alcohol and water mixes, right? <coughs> okay. We'll see more about solvents as we go along. Comment on water. Again, what water is good for what type of compounds? Salts. Also, more generically, or the same thing, ions. Water is best for ions. Will water dissolve any neutral organics? Yes. Sugar is a neutral organic with no octet. Sugar is not an ion. Water will dissolve sugar. But guess what? You have to heat it, don't you? You have to give it some help. Uh, there's a number of organics that will dissolve in water with heat. Um, in general, though, water is best for ions. You can have simple non-organic ions, but you can also have organic ions. That is, ions that also contain some organic portion or carbon portion. Usually these are soluble in water. That's your starting point. There's a number of exceptions though. Some notable exceptions. Calcium oxalate is actually not soluble in water, or not that, not particularly soluble in water, even though it's ions. And we're not going to discuss why, we, it, you know, that'd be a long theoretical discussion. Where do we see calcium oxalate? Kidney stones. They form solids in kidneys, even though there's lots of water around in the kidney. But calcium oxalate precipitates out because it's not that soluble in water. Notable exceptions. Uh, sodium urate. Sodium salt of uric acid. Okay. Not that soluble in water. It precipitates in the joints and causes gout, I believe even though there's lots of water around your joints. All right? So some exceptions to the point of ionics. This is just some reading, okay? I don't want to just read to you. That's just a little summary. Um, see if there's anything there, you can ask questions. This is an extraction. We're going to look at this a little bit later. This should actually be in the next handout, but it's here. We'll have to come back to it. This is using SEP funnel. Everybody have a SEP funnel in your drawer? SEP funnel, separatory <coughs> funnel. Okay. Uh, two <coughs> layers. Okay. Aqueous layer and then an organic layer like dichloromethane. We can separate things. This is taking advantage of acid base chemistry. We need to learn to cover some acid base chemistry first. The big thing here, and the thing that goes with the lab, is if you have two layers, you're not really going to be doing layers in lab, but if you had two layers, water and an organic solvent that did not mix, and then you had a compound like this, a neutral organic compound, which layer would it prefer, water layer or organic solvent layer? It's a neutral, lots of hydrocarbon. What type of, here we go, statements. Those are exceptions. What is our opening statement? What type of compound prefers water? 
ionic. That's your opening statement, except for exceptions. Is this ionic? So which layers are you going to prefer? Organic. Organic compound likes an organic solvent, like dissolves light. Okay. What about this compound? Hmm, that looks ionic. Ionics prefer water. water. Boom. Those are your opening statements. From there, you can have variation, exceptions. According to the lab. But here's what we need work on. How do you make something ionic when it maybe is originally ne neutral or meaning non-ionic? Typically acid-base chemistry. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, while we're here, I usually include some applications in my handouts. Sometimes we have time to look at them, sometimes not. Sometimes you look on your own as you're interested. Uh, this is a drug, uh, what's this, Crestor? Ever, ever heard of Crestor? If you watch TV, um, you likely have heard of Crestor. Um, okay, it's a statin drug for lowering cholesterol. This is Crestor molecule, a beautiful organic molecule, sitting in the enzyme. Most drugs bind to an enzyme. How do they bind? By covalent interactions or non-covalent interactions? Yes, 99% of the time it's non-covalent interactions. Such as hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, even ionic, even van der Waals. We covered all the IMFs. And if, if this is going to bind to the enzyme, the more IMFs, the better, because it'll make it really want to bind there. And this is showing all the IMFs uh, that this drug is doing. Um, Got to be careful, though, sometimes. Let's look at them. For example, right here. Well, let's do this one first. There's lone pairs here. They're not showing lone pairs. This is associating with what? The hydrogen that's on an end. So this would be an H bond donor, and that would be an acceptor, right? So we have this IMF. Got to be careful. Sometimes you wonder who drew these things. I didn't draw it. What are they showing here? It looks like two oxygens are hydrogen bonding. No. It's really, this is hydrogen bonding to what? They should have showed it like that. But somebody was kind of not paying attention or just, or, or didn't know what they were doing. Uh, you see any other kind of, like that, like right here, oxygen to oxygen? What is this? It's really, and then what is, I, I don't know. I suspect that this is going to be an acceptor because there's no H there. And this hydrogen binding to the H, right? Please correct all that. Do you have any questions? Or? Uh, this could be hydrogen bonding. We've got an O lone pair and an H is only in. But that could also be what instead? Which is actually stronger than hydrogen bonding. Ion ion, because this is an ion and that's a positive. That can, we could just call that ion attraction. What is going on here? They're calling it hydrophobic bonds. You see this hydrocarbon uh, group? It's an isopropyl. Can it do anything? <coughs> it's actually forming van der Waals or London dispersion forces with the alkyl groups on these amino acids. You know your amino acids? Leucine. Leucine. What's the side chain on leucine? or valine, or alanine. The side chain on all these amino acids is just hydrocarbon. Okay? On valine, I think it's something like, it's, it's very similar to this. Coming off the amino acid, and how can these interact? Just 
dispersion forces. Okay, so you do get some interaction here. Very weak, but it's something. They're calling it hydrophobic bonds. You don't see that term much. Um, okay, uh, down below. Uh, anatomy of a soap. Anybody ever use soap? <laughs> soap is typically uh, comes from fatty acids. That is, if this was an H, that would be a carboxylic acid, right? Okay. Fatty acid is in the ion form, typically. And then you have this long hydrocarbon tail. It has dual character. It has some ionic character, which is good for associating with water. You guys bathe with water or acetone? Water. Okay. So, so this likes water because it's ionic. But then this portion of the soap likes what? It likes oils and grease. Okay. Your skin or your hair gets oily. Okay. So you put this on your hair. And this starts associating with the oils, but then you've got to have something that wants to like the water, so it will go with the water down the drain. Well, this portion likes the water, so you have sort of a mediator. Now, it actually, it sets up something like this. You've got a grease globule, like in your hair or on your skin. These hydrocarbon nonpolar chains sort of interact with it, and you can form like a micelle or something. With the outer sphere being the polar portion, the outer sphere interacts with the water, and you, you're able to remove grease using water. Two things that hate each other. And that would be able to soak. Okay? Again, we don't have time for every little application like this, but these are the things that you need to think about and see the extension of the basic information. Hopefully it's also of interest. Uh, the remainder we may look back at. Uh, please take a look. Let some things sink in and then we can readdress it. See if you look at things. See if you have any questions. Uh, while I'm searching for the next handout, it's always a good time for questions. What's the name of the next handout? Acid base chemistry. <clears throat> How are we doing, guys? Chemistry. There's some more about questions, types of questions that hopefully you'll be able to answer when we get done, including the one on the back with the drug tramadol. There was a similar question in the pre-course worksheet on this acid base. the acid base mechanism. One of the most important sheets we'll look at in this course right here. You guys must understand acid base chemistry and it begins with understanding the, the one and only mechanism. Some of you guys may have seen a little bit of this in Jim Kim because we Trying to start doing that in gin chem. Historically, you guys just just want to know some acids and bases, but you do not know how to predict or understand what an acid does or what a base does. This is it. Acid-base mechanism. The basic compound will have a basic atom, the lone pair. We're talking about Bronsted-Lowry acid base, proton, lone pairs. The lone pair of your base. You can identify the basic atom. A lone pair belongs to an atom. 
And we'll talk about how we do that. But once you identify the, the basic lone pair, the lone pair is then going to bond to the H of the acid. Bronson and Lowry, we got a proton. The proton is going to be bonded to something. There's no Z on the periodic table. That's generic. It can be one atom, or it can be a huge remainder of molecule. Okay? The lone pair goes and makes a bond to the H. This is what this mechanism arrow is showing. We will use mechanism arrows with lots of reactions. Here we're doing an acid base. I will typically circle the lone pair. This lone pair is going to make a bond to H. That's what that arrow means. These electrons have to move the H, because H can only make one bond. We're making a new bond here. <coughs> These electrons move on to this atom, becoming a lone pair. The result of this, what, what does arrow mean? Or what do the arrows mean? This means this is making a bond to H. Well, now the basic atom is bonded to the H. We just made that bond. Those two electrons used to be a lone pair, but now they're bonded to the H. The H and that atom are no longer bonded to each other. These electrons left the H, breaking the entire bonding. Moving on to Z as a lone pair. So Z has now gone from the H, but now it has a lone pair. That lone pair used to be that covalent bond, but now it moved, we moved it, on the board, we move it onto that atom as a lone pair. Anytime you do an acid base reaction, it should be done with that mechanism. No exception if you're doing Brunstead Lowry. To me, very powerful for helping you guys understand and predict any acid base reaction and the outcome. Because the outcome is here. It comes from that. If you do that, you really don't have to think as much about the outcome. Okay. Please read, for example, charges. In my generic, I don't, I'm not showing any charges. But typically, in the acid-base reaction, you're going to have, on one side, the species will be neutral. On the other side, it will be charged. By the way, look at the very last page of this handout. Mine's wife is on the copy of the page. Very last page. Not the back of it, but the, the front side of the very last page. Miscellaneous points to remember. Everybody got that? That's, that's, that's free information right there, guys. It's a summary of important points. Free information. Charges are probably discussed there. Okay. If you're asked to predict an acid-base reaction outcome, you use your mechanism, that mechanism, to do it, and then arrive at the answer. Okay, let's look at acid-base chemistry. Uh, all the top is intro. I'm not going to spend any time on that other than you, you understand Ka, pKa. Stronger the acid, what happens to the pKa? Strong acid, lower the pKa, right? Just the opposite for Ka, but typically we use pKa's. And when we give a pKa for a base, the pKa is really referring to what? The conjugate acid. Okay? You guys spent an entire semester on acid-base chemistry in Gen Chem 2, right? Don't y'all learn to do acid-base chemistry there? Okay. The equilibrium stuff, it's up there. Uh, that's your background. Let's start here, though. Example of some acids. We know stronger acid will have a lower pKa. 
HCl, we know it's a strong acid, pK of about negative 7, that, that value will vary in textbooks. Okay. Um, and we're out of time for today. Please be looking ahead. We'll move through, as usual, pretty quickly. I hope you realize it's in your benefit to have looked ahead and be ready for what's coming. Write questions down, et cetera, et cetera. Have a nice day, guys.